I got my first moving violation when I was 11 years old for riding a dirt bike on the street. Growing up in the islands, my brothers and I were into dirt bikes and together with some neighborhood kids, we'd ride all over the place. State lands and housing development sites. We'd plot out a little track and have at it. The cops would often come and kick us out. The difference now is I'm a middle-aged family man and a university professor. I pay taxes and vote, but I still need to skulk around and dodge the cops if I want to test my car. When we were a little older and got into building cars, my brothers and I made good use of the Hawaii Raceway Park drag strip. The outlaw races, or run what you brung events on Saturday nights, was our thing. We'd race our souped up streetcars, my father's station wagon. We even built a dedicated race car to go a little faster. It kept us busy and out of trouble, and the raceway didn't just serve drag racers. The venue had a well-used road course and a stock car track. It was the only place for car racing enthusiasts on Oahu. The track closed in 2006 because of zoning and other regulatory issues. The closure was not for lack of use. If anything, Hawaii Raceway Park was too small to serve the demand for a race venue on Oahu. This has left a lot of racing families and enthusiasts, people like me, without a safe outlet for our passion. Numerous speed shops have been shuttered, machine and transmission shops have lost business, family racing traditions are dying, and street racing has reemerged as a public safety concern. Maui, Kauai, and the Big Island all have well-used tracks with vibrant communities of racers, but there's nothing for the car folks on the most populated island. This film explores the unique speed culture that Hawaii has fostered and my efforts to keep a racing passion alive without a motorsports venue on Oahu. In recent years, I built a car and a truck, and I want to test and race them without breaking the law to practice the car building tradition I grew up with. This is not something new to Hawaii. There is a long and distinguished history of racing cars and motorcycles throughout the islands. Mike Kitchens, a local motorsports photographer and former racer at Hawaii Raceway Park, has made a hobby of studying this history. The first actual vehicle arrived in the islands in 1899. It was owned by Henry P. Baldwin. It was a wood electric. Now these are horseless carriages that um, run on batteries. Now as more of them accumulated on the island, they started to participate in, in events. People were using them beyond their normal scope, you know, day-to-day -day transportation. People started doing the legal street races, cops having to chase them down on horseback. You can actually see the buildup just from this one or two to 15, 20 participating parades. And they used to have these floor parades that were dedicated to the, the automobile. But then that progressed into, hey, they're doing illegal time runs from Honolulu all the way across the island and then back. The first organized auto race was in 1908. The first car got here in 1899, and by, in nine years, they've got organized racing. And the first race between two women was actually within that time period as well. In the islands, as was occurring across the country, car culture and amateur racing was happening before World War II, but it became amplified, much bigger, with all the vets coming back from the war and looking for an adrenaline rush and there's a big military presence on Oahu. The post-World War II era is when speed culture really took off nationwide, and that was true of Hawaii as well. It was during the 50s that the expression halvela, meaning hot metal, came into use to refer to hot rods locally. It's hard to find people with direct experience of the post-World War II race scene in Hawaii. I sought out Roland Leong, a native Hawaiian and living legend for his success in managing top fuel drag racing teams. Roland introduced me to Jimmy Fluger and Earl Safari Char. Few now know how important Fluger was to the speed culture on Oahu, but his name always comes up quickly when you speak to the old timers. Fluger basically built Hawaii Raceway Park as a community service, but also had a racing career in the islands as a driver. Earl Char was a great local driving talent who worked for and was sponsored by Fluger. Char to me is a living treasure who holds a lot of first-hand knowledge of what the Oahu race scene was like during the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. During the post-World War II era, before Hawaii Raceway Park, drag racing and road course racing occurred at small airstrips around Oahu, but especially on one built during the war at Kahuku. We lined up and somebody flagged you off and that was about it. 
We didn't really go fast. We didn't know much about how to go fast. And that's about it. It was mostly kind of like friendly race. It was just a fun day. I can recollect back in the 50s, they were racing at Kahuku, the old air airstrip. And I was interested in cars, so I went to one of the races. And the day I went to the races, I was so bitten about races, I said I had to get into racing. So I saved up $300, I bought a 48, 46 Chevrolet, four door. My brother and I pulled the engine out, and once it ran, we drove it to Kahuku. We reached Kahuku town, it created a knock. So my brother said, what are we going to do now? I said, we're going to go race it. Since it's broken, we'll break it all the way. So what's the difference, <laughs> right? That's a With spirit. a broken engine, I won. Me and my buddies one day figured, well, you know, well, after racing on the street, because, you know, that's all we did then, back then, we figured, well, why don't we try to take it to the drag strip? Of course, you're not going to tell your parents you race a car because you know, they go crazy, right? We, we took the floor mats up and we took a punch and punched a hole in the floor, put a boat in it, boated the seat belts in, and off we went. My sister, who is four years older than me, her and her boyfriend were down there. I remember I'm like 15, 16 years old. Oh, they, they my sister see her, our family car going up and down the track, right? Well, <laughs> she went home to my parents, boy, I got in big trouble for that, right? You know, but I guess that was kind of the start of it. Stock car racing also became very popular with well-attended races at the old Honolulu Stadium. When you look at what happened at Honolulu Stadium, you're talking about thousands of people. I mean, literally thousands, 10, 15,000 something people coming out to watch a stock car race. The fact is, even without a racetrack here, we still have this huge amount of people that are interested in racing. I got a ride from Johnny Manette, who had a used car lot, and the, the car turned over and caught on fire. And I couldn't get anybody to build me a car or to give me a ride. So I have a friend in Owen Phillips, his brother Oscar, George Inamura, and another fellow, Nelly Cow, and they built me a 32 coupe. And we went racing. Lori and Yuki Miyagawa were former Hawaii Raceway Park racers. Lori shared great memories of growing up, watching stock car racing on the Big Island and at Honolulu Stadium. I don't know if you remember Jimmy Unser. He had a stock car running at Honolulu Stadium. He used to ship his car once a year to the Big Island. I would see the cars racing. You have the bleachers and the backside is all bushes. Okay, lava and whatever. And the cars go off the track and then you see this car with branches hanging out coming back on the track. <laughs> right, right. When we came here to Honolulu Stadium, you know, they had races every night at the Honolulu Stadium. In the backside is Bolodrome. In the parking lot was the pits for the race cars. Yeah. What was great was after the last race, all the cars park in the infield and uh, we could all go in, climb in the car and everything. Hawaii Raceway Park opened in 1964 and provided a great motorsports resource for the people of Oahu. The Kuhuku Airstrip held races just once a month, but Hawaii Raceway Park was every week and more. I feel privileged to have heard the story of how the raceway got started from Jimmy Fluger himself. I enjoyed surfing at Makapu, and when I would drive out there, you pass Sandy Beach and you see these black skid marks on the highway. I thought to myself, what is this? What's going on? So I asked around and they told me that the kids blocked it off at 3 o'clock in the morning and they raced. And I said, I'd started Fluger Lincoln Mercury at the time. I said, this is not okay. So that's what started me to help these kids get off the street. I had a friend who was the head of Hot Rod Magazine by the name of Ray Brock. He introduced me to Wally Parks who ran he started the racing in America. And he provided an insurance policy. So it was set up for safety. But the kids could race all night. They stopped all racing on the street. And it was a good thing. Oh, that was my best years of racing. I was there for the grand opening. We brought in uh, Dino Don Nicholson's Comet, the wagon called the Ugly Duckling, for me to drive. 
and on the opening day I waxed everybody that I raced against and right after that the comments came in from the mainland and then I raced every race from then on to about uh, 1967 or 68. Then after that I went into Top Fuel Dragsters. Who would sponsor the Top Fuel cars? Me. Are you just paying for it out of your pocket? Yeah. Serious? Yeah, that's why after two or three years I gave up because I knew it was a losing proposition. Um, making my dream come true, he built me a car so I could race it down the bottom mile. Uh, Daily's altered was after my 68 come around. I handed down to her to drive and she drove it on a quarter at 10.50s uh, on a dial in and uh, she still run at 136 miles an hour on a quarter. It, we're all on equal footing. There's no handicap between female and male. Just because I'm a female, they don't give you a break. You know, and so when you beat them, feels good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> Building and racing cars is very expensive, but this expense creates a cottage industry. Back in the 70s and 80s, there were speed shops all over Oahu. Now there's only one. I met Craig Takaguchi, a local machine shop owner, while having some engine work done a few years ago. Say my um, motorsport machine work part is, say, 15 to 20% right now. I, I think it might increase it, maybe. Five, five to ten percent more. So maybe, in essence, yeah, I guess it might double. Paul Giovanetti still runs a transmission shop that served local racers when we had a track. At the time, I was probably making maybe seventy percent of the racing transmissions out there. Well, I know that the I know that the machine shops um, they tapered off and they lost a lot of business. I mean, they did. When I bought my fueler engine. At that time, this is 1970s, my engine cost me $18,000. And every race, if you want to race, go fast, you probably burn a couple pistons. And your tires, your rear tires, they're good for good, I would say, eight solid runs. And you have to buy new tires because otherwise you go up in smoke. The clutches probably run you, I would say, a solid 16 runs, then you'd have to change all the clutch plates again. So it became a very costly proposition. We had some brief interactions with Chuck Garner at his Corvette shop when I was a kid. A friend who lived across the street and would race with us at Hawaii Raceway Park worked at Chuck Garner's shop. I remember we once found an aluminum Corvette rim at the Kailua landfill and we schlepped it down to Chuck's shop to make a buck. We have an island that would be astronomical if there was a raceway stadium or a raceway park like Las Vegas. Uh, I don't think they understand the figures that go along with a, with a multi-purpose racetrack. I, I think the money part is not really the biggest part, you know, um, you know, the, the stimulus and everything. It's more of a passion, you know, that, you know, um, well, you, you got the uh, golfers got the golf course. Um, you got the clubs, but you, you can't use it um you know uh, the tennis players got you know a tennis courts you know and um do you uh do they do they need it do do we need a racetrack um i think it's more because we want it everyone we spoke to seemed to have a different story about why hawaii raceway park closed without an alternative Mike Oakland, the last owner of the track, has been vilified by many in the race community for overseeing the closure. Hindsight now can clearly see that closing the raceway before construction began on the new track was a blunder. But I think on balance, Mike did his best to get a new venue built on what is known as Parcel 9, between two airstrips on the decommissioned Barbers Point Naval Air Station. To this day, Parcel 9 is designated for a motorsports venue. We had been operating on, on variances and extensions of leases and, and temporary uh, permissions from the county and from Campbell and, and all the rest of that. And so 
We went all over the island looking for an, a, an appropriate place to build a racetrack. And it turned out that Barbers Point was closing, so we applied for lands there and got 150 acres designated as a motorsports complex on Barbers Point. And at the time, we got permission from the feds, the state, and the county um, approved the use of that property out there, Barbers Point property, as a racetrack. So in order to uh, comply with the EPA, the expiring variance, the terminating lease, the dissolution of the Campbell estate, uh, all concurrent coming together at the same time, and with the ability to have the Barber's Point thing uh, probably up and operating if we could have, we said, fine, that's the end of it, we'll close it. And then everything went pew, the economy went pew, people went nuts, and it was like, whatever. Having a racetrack gave people like Roland Leong the opportunity to develop their passion for racing into distinguished careers. Hawaii has produced other famous racers. Danny on the gas and Gaius is a world-class driving talent who got his start in the islands. And Gaius has been successful in motorcycle, sports car, Formula One, and drag racing. He's the only native Hawaiian to have raced in the Indianapolis 500. This one year uh, I built a dragster up there and I was gonna go to Indianapolis with it. So I called my mom and said, hey, I'm gonna go to, uh, take my car to Indy, gonna race it. And she said, oh yeah, we're going with you. I said, I don't know, unbeknownst to me, she calls a friend of mine, Ed on Gaius, and, and sends them up. So they came up there, helped me drive there and work on the car, and we went to Indy and, and raced in Indy. Well, when we came back, uh, uh, of course, uh, Gaius met the, the guys that owned the shop and that I worked at, okay? And they owned dragsters too. And uh, he wanted to drive one, so they let him drive one of their cars. In the late 70s, John DeSoto, a national motocross champion, was a bit of a hero to me. I remember reading about the flying Hawaiian in the dirt bike magazines of the time. I had a motocross bike called an Osa Phantom, and DeSoto was being sponsored by Osa and racing Phantoms nationally. After retiring from his career, he went on to serve for many years on the Honolulu City Council. And they talk about, oh, it's, it's a Hawaiian you know, Hawaiian sport, you know, the surfing, the canoeing and stuff like that. But don't, they don't really realize if it wasn't for these, if it wasn't for the automobiles, a lot of people who experience outside from Hawaii get to see things, really come back and see what, what we really have, what we appreciate, you know, because, you know, I have a lot of the Hawaiian people, you know, you, we gotta keep the, you know, this is crazy, you know, riding cars and going fast. And so I says, where'd you come from? Well, I came from Molokai. So how'd you come from Molokai? Did you paddle your canoe like the Hawaiians did? Or you swam? Oh, you caught an airplane, the modern stuff? They look at me, they give me an eye. So when you got to the airport, did you walk out here? Or did you ride a, um, or ride a horse? Or you rented an American car? You know, they are, they get all mad. But see, those things are done already, it's fast. But this done is just gave us an opportunity to see what the rest of the world is like. The thing is, Hawaii has developed a distinctive local style speed culture. It's just not recognized or valued very much. Racing here is harder than on the mainland because the parts are less accessible and everything's more expensive. This cultivates a friendlier, more gracious, and resourceful community of racers. And being in Hawaii, it's a community that's more centered on family and being together, eating, and having a good time. People like the Oaklands, Mike and Pam, bear witness to this warmer racing community. We were fiercely competitive but family. And the story I want to share with you is more than once I would drive in between rounds from Campbell Industrial Park, Hawaii Raceway Park, to Waipahu, Leonui Street, on the old two-lane Farrington Highway when there was no lights, no nothing. I won't tell you how fast we went to get parts for our competitors so we could have a race. There was no fun in racing an empty lane. And we would, because we had the parts store, and we always brought spares, we, because we could. There's a lot of racers that, if you need anything, if they got it, 99% of them will lend it to you. There's a few that won't. And, and everybody knows who that is, and they, if they need something, they don't get it either. We also met Russell Odegaard, who grew up at the raceway and ended up as the announcer in the tower. All these people participated in the racing and had front row seats for viewing the speed culture that developed in Hawaii. I had seen it happen many a times. If Paul was racing his Volkswagen, 
and the motor blew up. And there was another racer out there that was racing that same day. And if they broke their transmission, Paul's the kind of guy that would yank the guy's motor out of his car. Paul would yank out his transmission and let the guy use his transmission. You know, and, and even from being Volkswagen stuff to even back in the, in the late 80s when the economy was really good here, all these NHRA legal pro stock V8 race cars started showing up out of Hawaii Street Park. And Paul was one of them. I mean, these guys were going out and spending $150,000, $200,000 on race cars. And they were bringing them out to Hawaii Street Park. And all these guys were helping out each other. And that's what I saw a lot out there. The closing of the raceway has been devastating to the speed culture on Oahu because people learn about how to wrench on cars and fabricate parts, weld and tune from others in the community. A lot of that knowledge gets passed on within families, but also between friends. From a young age, people are introduced to motorsports. It becomes a way of life, a deep passion, a focus of social and family activity. Without a race venue, the chain of cultural transmission is broken on Oahu. I heard other stories like mine of people growing up in Hawaii's speed culture heyday during the 60s and 70s, families and friends having adventures together and learning from each other through their passion for racing. My dad, my dad, Cobra, known as the Cobra, that's a snake, you know, because he rode a Vespa before and he had an exhaust system that rattled like a snake, you know. And he would have, um, have motorcycles, Harley Davidson's with the suicide clutch. I was five years old, you know, in Hawaii Kai. You know, it was all swamp areas and dairies and stuff, and my dad put me on a motorcycle, on a, on a Harley Davidson, put me in the front, and of course, you know, being young, you kind of touch the, you know, the, the, the clutch or anything, so he would let me go in first gear, put it in first gear, and all of a sudden he would jump off. Five years old on Harley Davidson, and I go, oh my God, I don't know how I'm gonna stop this thing, right? And I'm going like this, and he's laughing as a dickens, right? And uh, so I saw a 55 gallon drum and said, okay, probably I'm gonna try to hit that thing and maybe it'll stop, you know. I hit the five, 55 gallon drum, jumped off, and I went, whew, oh, it's okay. Turn around, look at my mom and dad. My mom was beating my dad up with her purse, boom, 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 cracking. Yeah, she was cracking. So that was the, the first time, five years old. People say, uh, I guess you learned from hard knocks, huh? I said, well, I, I guess you could call it that, because uh, there was no school. <laughs> that you could go to. When I was a little kid, uh, not even in the first grade, and George Cambro is George Cambro Movie Studios, who uh, is kind of big over here in Hawaii. They do like all the Hawaii Five O and everything. But George Cambro raced a funny car. And they would start that car up, and they would do water burnouts on Papipi Road, which is the main road going in the Howbush. And we're talking back in the 70s, and they would have all the neighborhood kids, we'd all get on our bicycles and ride down the road and tell the neighbors not to back their cars out. Because there's going to be a car going about 160 miles an hour down seconds. Papipi Road because Mr. Cambra's working on his car. Then Mr. Cambra would they'd load up all the neighborhood kids and take us out to Hawaii Street Park. And so I found myself going out there every weekend. Russell Odegaard introduced us to Bobby Enos, a lifelong racer with fun recollections of both learning about and sharing our island speed culture. I grew up, you know, as a, as a young boy, you know, with all these other guys, you know. You pick up little things here and there, and then when you get your car, yeah, I want to do this, I saw them do this, I saw them do that. I was 11 years old when I started driving. I had my own car, I used to go through the back roads to school and park them outside, you know. <laughs> So where did you get your knowledge about like how to modify cars? From from all these guys. So they kind of pass it on. Yeah, to you. just watch. You know, you learn, and you know, you you they gadoot as you call it. You know, right. you used to run around and grab stuff for them and right, right, and yeah. everything just right. to hang around with them. You know. So he was like their gopher kind of a thing. Well, in the beginning. Right, right, and then they take after a while. A little bit. Uh, yeah, after a while, I had other people. You know, who were under your way. Yeah, yeah. Right. With no legal race venue, many former Oahu racers have turned to the cruise scene as a way to use their cars. 
People get together with their families, friends, and cars in parking lots at the Pearl Ridge Mall, the Windward Mall, the Akai Park Shopping Center, the Wendy's in Kapolei, the Manana McDonald's in Pearl City, and other places around Oahu. They show off their cars, meet with their friends, eat, talk story, and share car building insights. Sometimes driving cruises are organized with groups of hot rods motoring around the island. Well, after the racetrack, the, they canceled the races and, you know, it was funny things to do, so I started building empty cars for this, hobby. Yeah, right, right. This was a Toys for Tots drive. We all paraded our cars down um, by the zoo and drop off all the gifts there. I see. It's uh, something we do yearly. We right. do a lot of community service, usually on um, Christmas time, all the Christmas parades that decorate our cars and, uh, you know, everybody appreciate, you know, nice cars. Rocky and Crystal Diaz represent another Oahu racing family that has adopted to the loss of our track by attending cruises and building custom cars for display. Yeah, I used to do racing in Hawaii Street Park, but with a bike. Motorcycle? Yeah. So what happened when the park closed? Just no more racing? I sold the bike, yeah. Yeah, you had to sell the bike? I used to run eight. Eight Mid, seconds. Mid eights, eight fives. When I bought the car, I found it on Craigslist. So I called my son and I said, boy, you're on 49 Merc. I was into, was always into these Mercury's. I said, but it's a basket case. If you're not going to help me build them, I'm not going to buy them. He said, no, buy them, buy them. We can do them. I said, okay. And I bought it for six grand. And I brought it home in my truck. Right. Because it's just pieces. It was all pieces. It was all in pieces. So then I bought it and it took us three and a half years to build it. Just in your garage? In my garage. But well, we, we come every week. Well, we got a 35 Dodge also, so. We meet with all our friends. We have, you know, this talk story and, you know, shoot the shit, whatever. Right. Yeah, not a thing in the world wrong with that. No. I look forward to it every week. What role did your wife play in all this? She didn't no say. She just tolerated yeah, She just tolerated him. <laughs> <laughs> She's far away. <laughs> and I have a 35 Dodge. Um, we used to go down the track every weekend. My husband raced a uh, drag bike. Rocky's your husband. Yeah, with the, with the 49 Mercury. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's my the car. Motorcycle racer. The we motorcycle. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 We're down the track fine. every Friday, Saturday um, for years. And he used to race the quarter mile with the drag bike, doing high eights, low eights, whatever it was. But yeah, it was our um, our family thing. My son wrenched the bike. He was a wrench. Rocky was a driver. So we were there, and then the track ended, and he sold the bike so we could build the Merc. We also encountered Tyrell Chang and Michelle Torres at different cruise events on Oahu. They represent the many young people we've interviewed who need a racing venue. To me, it's no sense to go to work if you're not doing what you love. It's a, it's a hobby. If you've done it for so many generations, it turns into a culture. And this is like a heritage to a lot of us. Because you see, you can you can take a look around this parking lot. There's groups of families, not just friends. This has got a supercharger on it. Did you put that on there? Yeah, we actually did a complete motor swap. So it's a 426 Hemi okay. freight motor with a supercharger on it. Oh, wow, all right. Definitely all right. track ready, just need a track. <laughs> Do you have any outlet to sort of use this car's potential as it stands right, right now? now? No. <laughs> no? Yeah. Not any safe place to do it. The fellowship and car craft on display at the various cruise scenes is enjoyable, but it does not allow me to use my cars. It's more of a way to display your car. I've only street raced maybe two or three times in my hot rodding career. With a racetrack, it just wasn't necessary. Now with two cars built and no place to go, I'll admit to exploring the current street race scene with more than just journalistic interest. We found out where people meet to set up races and interviewed many racers. Tony Coglawan is a local street racing veteran, and Edward Alba fits the profile of a military transplant with a racing passion. Everyone we spoke to expressed how they would be at a track instead of a parking lot setting up illegal races if there was a track to go to. 
We also learned how during the summer of 2013, the runout, the part of the track used for slowing down at what was left of the old Hawaii Raceway Park track, was unofficially open for eighth mile racing over several weekends. Russell Odegaard told me that they would see 100 cars on a single weekend day. We're talking down low, half-baked, eighth mile racing announced through word of mouth, and you see 100 cars in a day? That says something about the demand for a race venue on Oahu. Uh, we raced out there. Uh, Bobby Enos told me that he wanted me to be off the streets and go play over there, so which I did. So you're saying they'll vault, you were mentioning also how they'll block a whole, the whole freeway and create like an open space. Yes, so yes, yes, they do Can you that. describe how that works? Uh, what they do is they tie up the whole lanes. Uh, it doesn't matter who's out there, if you get people want to go home, or they feel like um, maybe they're going to work, or you know, coming back from work or going on lunch. They tie up the whole lanes all the way to the exit. So they'll have like six cars, and the six cars will all kind of pace. And well, be there's a big side. group. Uh, I would say maybe about 50 cars all at once out there. So there'll be all these cars, but then like six of them will block all the lanes. Exactly. I came to Hawaii really excited because I was told that there was a racetrack here, and there wasn't. You know, so the first year I got here, I was just like, you know, bought a family car. Um, avoiding it, avoiding it, then, you know, had to buy a second vehicle for my family, ended up buying a, a little import, and then I ended up tuning it up, and my neighbors just like, let's go out, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 and then about three months later, came out here, you know, uh, the wife was on vacation, and they're coming back at five in the morning with uh, about an inch of tread worn off of my tires. I got busted, um, I was recorded, uh, lost uh, rank in the military. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, I lost rank in the military for it. Um, I don't know, it's kind of addicting, this, this lifestyle, it really is, but it's a positive, I think. Really, if we had the chance to do this legally, we all would. While street racing has re-emerged as a problem on Oahu since Hawaii Raceway Park closed, there was also a huge street racing scene on Oahu during the 50s and early 60s before the track opened. People were street racing all over the place, but Sandy's Beach is probably the most notorious. Sandy Beach was probably the most organized, but the guys that get out there and, and spectators and line their cars up on both sides of the road, facing the road, and you get ready to run a run, a run everybody turned the headlights on. So they, had, they had signals to do all of that. Flag man, same flag man from Kahuku. <laughs> flag everybody and get it going. And you wonder, you know, because it wasn't that much, again, not that much traffic in those days. Nighttime out there, it was, it was pretty, every now and then you might have a car. You know? And I think what the police were doing is they just tell them hang on a little while. And then they see the headlights shut off and they let them go. <laughs> so it, was, it wasn't organized, believe me, right. but it seemed to work whenever right. we did it. Yeah. A kinder, gentler time. <laughs> yeah. Street racing is just too reckless for me. Like many of my Oahu peers, I'm now looking to the neighbor islands to get a speed fix. At the venues on Kauai, Maui, and the Big Island, we met generations of families engaged in racing. On all the neighbor islands, we also saw junior dragster programs, which allow the children and racing families to participate in the fun. And uh, how did you get into this? How did you start junior drag racing? Um, I've been watching since I was at least five or six years old. I watched my uncle over there. Right. And my dad uh, bought me a car, and that's how I started. Right on. How long have you been doing this now? Maybe for like five or six months. I've always come to races. My father brought me when I was a little girl, I see. but I never raced. I, I only come to watch. And then with my husband and his brother, they all race. So, and then now my son. So, I mean, my experience with him, I was really nervous the first day, but it's been a lot more relaxing now so, since he's done a lot of passes. And we have a good pit crew, right. so I enjoy it. I said, hey, you want to do that? I said, yeah, sure. But, you know, uh, we're kind of afraid because, uh, you know, 
spend all that money and he can say yes all day but when he gets in that car he, you know it's a whole different thing but ended up he loved it first time he made a pass the first question he asked me at the end of the track was dad did have smoke from the tires after he did the burnout at maui raceway park we had the honor of meeting ken silva the president of the valley isle timing association unlike hawaii raceway park which was always a private for-profit venture the neighbor island tracks are all built on land provided by the state with state subsidized racing infrastructure the races are organized staffed and run once or twice a month by volunteers who are also racing association members <laughs> like i told one of my friends you know, I, I, I'm with all these pains, you know, from the period of time. And like, once I go in that car and I fire it up, I feel like I'm 20 years old. But that, you just come young you, for just the noise and the rush. But as soon as it's over, you come back and everybody, yeah, yeah, talking, talking, talking. Oh, shit. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you feel the oldness come back again. Right, right. And that was last May, a Memorial Day race. I was on the tower side going down, and it was Roy Kanto and Camaro on the other side. It was just lucky I was way in front of him. The oil line for the transmission cooler came apart. Brand new cooler just pulled apart. And also the car went right, heading to the guardrail. And all I could think was, the guy coming down, what are I going to do? Turn, throttle, brake. I turned, I face him this way now. And I kept on doing that all the way down on two wheels, like I showed you the picture, until the car settled down and went straight. It was a mess of oil on the track. Right, 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 right. But everybody, they, they came down there, they were always shaking. And I guess from outside looking at it was real bad. And I told him, what's the matter with you guys? I thought, look, I'm steady as a rock and you guys all nervous. <laughs> so my friend guys told me, you know, you cannot race her. You too old. Don't tell me that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, you know, we're all friends until we meet on the line then. Right. right. <laughs> then yeah. the gloves are off. Yeah, yeah. But other than that, it's, you know, everybody, all nice people down here. Right, right. That's a great thing about racing, you know, uh, camaraderie. Riley DeCoito is a young helo racer who to me captures perfectly the hands-on, do-it-yourself ingenuity that goes into race car or hot rod building. He's part of a group of resourceful helo racers that deploy used Mazda rotary engines to go fast on a shoestring budget. Me and my dad had to custom make this intake manifold and the uh, exhaust manifold, the header. We had right. to custom make it both for this car and we also had to custom make motor mounts, we custom made tranny mounts, we had to make a drive shaft. We have to run the piping for the for the new electric water pump. What kind of carburetor is this? This is this is a, a triple barrel Weber 45. Came okay. off of the old the old style Porsches. I see. And the Porsches ran two of these carburetors, I so see. I I have basically half of it. This car has a lot of mix ma mix match parts, you know. Right. The drivetrain, it's a it's a Mazda rotary, a 13B six port engine. Right. I have um. 71 Toyota Celica transmission, four speed. So and I, you have to adapt that. I have an adapter to the rotary, the Mazda bell housing. Right. So, okay. Okay. and it has a Toyota truck rear end. Okay. <laughs> and it has, it has half of a, half of a truck drive shaft and the front half is from a Celica. I love it. So, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. RX-7 radiator, <laughs> you know. That's how you save money. Yeah, you use, you save use, money and use it. Yeah, use it whatever you got. Just, yeah, you know, really. do it yourself rather yeah. than buy it. Cool, that's there's, great. There's man. a lot of pride in this car, you know, knowing that we did this, you know. Yeah. Nobody else did this, we did this. Yeah. Hawaii racers have long shipped their cars to the neighbor islands for big races. Shipping costs have increased so much, however, that this is no longer a viable option for most. Some Oahu racers desperate for a venue now store their cars on the neighbor islands and fly over for race days. On the big island, we met Shailani Harris and her family who store their cars there and fly over from Oahu to race. Um, we're from Honolulu. Really? Yeah. Right, so how do you, how do you manage that, to have your cars here and everything? Um, Uncle Louie, thanks to Uncle Louie Pereira, he um, lets us keep all his stuff at his shop. So. I see. Everything stays here. I just help all these guys that come from uh, Honolulu because there's no way, no place for them to store their stuff. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so how many cars you got stored at your place? Uh, oh, a whole bunch. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I get about eight or eight or nine. Eight or nine cars. Yeah. These guys coming out regular. Yeah. Yeah. 
the biggest cost for them is flying over. I see. Because because as far as storing them, they store them for free. That's why they call me King Louis because they treat me like on King when I go to Honolulu. Right, right, right. Well, well you deserve it. <laughs> On Kauai, I found occasion to race for the first time in 30 years. It felt like I'd come home, found my people. It was such a great experience. I came home to my wife and started talking to her about relocating to Kauai. You get a lot of just, uh, uh, you know, every ordinary people just coming in, driving their ordinary cars. We get a lot of tourists coming in. And of course, they want to come, they drive, but you know, they come in the race. And some of them win, some of them win. <laughs> We're making a documentary film about island, what we call speed culture. And uh, a little bit of the theme is why Oahu doesn't have a track, but we also want to represent what's going on in the neighbor islands. It's sort of the passion, the families, uh, just the love of the sport. We followed four Kauai racers and myself through the race day. Mary Kay Aloha is an avid racer from a racing family. We also met Alma Koji and her son Mason. Eric Lazar is a fun-loving racer with a can-do attitude who seemed to exemplify the passion for racing that was palpable on all the neighbor islands. I've always been into cars, just from when I was little. And then my husband and I, it kind of became our thing together. So he has a car, I have a car, but right now it's just me racing. And our, we're all down here, my entire family. We all come out together. My sisters run the gate, my niece is working at the registration, she works the time slip booth. I volunteer a lot of time here, so I'm running around and I jump in my car and go down the track and then come back and it's fun. I've been better at the light. See, it's timing, you know, if you can get off the light line really fast, you do better. And you're, there's a the timing, you know, you're watching the lights blink by and all of a sudden it's green and you're too late actually, then you've got to start going when it's on the third yellow or the second, you know, your right, time right. watching Whatever yourself. Works for you. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This thing used to sit in my yard for about, it was sitting for about three years, and my mom got into racing her Corvette, and I said, well, you know what, let's, let's bring it back out. Right. You know, so I brought it out. It's a 92 Honda hatchback. It's got an Acura Integra motor in it, and I'm putting a little nitrous in it. Well, I've got the fever to do better, you know, and to, uh, I want to win it. I'd love to win a couple of them, you know. I want to one day go home with a trophy. My mom and I don't have to race against each other because we have two different classes. I see, I see. So you don't have the family rivalry. Right, we could, we could actually bring home two trophies. <laughs> That's yet to happen, but. Just, I, I came last year after they, they um, opened the track July 4th, and I'm like, Oh, I gotta do this. <laughs> I didn't have a car at the time, right. and so I was given this car. Police, police interceptor, bone stock. I'm on social security. I have no big budget to go racing, but it's it's my will, you know. If you want something bad enough, you can do it. You'll find a way or find an excuse. Right, right. So it's just a passion. Yeah, out. no, it's in my blood. It, it's there till I die. The race day is organized into a test and tune phase, followed by competition runs. Within this, people race in different classes, depending upon how fast and modified their cars are. As with most amateur drag racing, we're talking about brackets or bracket racing. This means that after testing your car, you register a dial-in time. And in the competition phase, the slower car is given a handicap based on the difference in dial-in times that both racers declare. This makes all the racing close and it also makes the racing about being consistent and having a fast reaction time. Of course, if you go faster than your dial-in, you're disqualified. It's called breaking out. The thing is, your reaction time between when the light is green and your tire passes the beam is not counted towards your dial-in time. So there's a huge advantage in being fast off the light. But if you red light, your tire passes the beam before the green, you're also disqualified. There is some skill involved. I missed the first of three test and tune runs, but that didn't seem to be a problem for me to race. Everyone was encouraging me, and I'm like, oh, I didn't bring a helmet. Here's one you can borrow. Oh, I missed getting the car tech inspected. Here comes the tech guy on a golf cart. Oh, I didn't get a registration for him. Here, you can use mine. 
Shoe polish to put your numbers on? Don't even think about it. There was just no saying no, so I took my two remaining test runs with everybody else. And a 2014 Chevy Sprint in the spectator size. <laughs> You need a zero in front of it. If it was 0 0.026, that'd be good. I'm going to bring that reaction time down. <laughs> so how'd your test run go? Good. Um, I ran a 10.21, which was pretty decent for the, the heat. Right, it's right. hot right now. so. Right. Good That's reaction pretty... time? Um, I went red a little bit. Oh. Um, I think I ran a 0.45, a negative 0.45. Okay. So I, I normally expect that out of my first run. I kind of... Um, push the limit? I kind of feel like I have to get like the, the bugs out of me. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. So how did it go with your test and tune phase? Well, um, not as good as I expected. Uh, my times are, I'm slower today. My reaction time is not what it should be. And then for the last uh, test, I thought, well, I'm gonna try a different, you know, um, tr trying to get off the line a little different with the lights. And um, I was like one one thousandth too fast. So it's kind of like, lighted. yeah, and it's just like, I don't know, it's such a tricky thing. Right. How did it go with the test? Terrible. I, uh, my nitrous is not working and my car is down, so. I see, like a solenoid, dude. Yeah, it's a solenoid. Nitrous. Yep. I got it. Yeah, okay. the nitrous solenoid is gone, so. I see. So you're just running on motor right yep, now? Yep, all motor. Okay, so. Well, what if you just go on motor, your bracket racing shouldn't matter that much. Mm, I could. I'm My motor, I kind of tuned it for the nitrous, so it's. Got it. It's a little, it's a little slow without it. I see. Um, it's a little bit of a setback for you. Right, it. right. Yeah, yeah. Still gonna be run through the night anyway. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a shot. Why not? And so, how did your first run go? Oh, good. I actually, uh, today I ran faster than last month. I did a 16.4, and then this last time I did a better okay, reaction junior time. Characters. Just, you know, nice. I'm having four. fun just by We're being here and doing. You. Yeah, I hear you right. know, and and my whole goal is tonight is to not get eliminated the first Street round. Okay? You know, that's. Right. Gotta, you gotta make some type of goal to achieve. The first competition round saw the thrill of winning and the pain of losing on full display. So how did your uh, first round go? To have oh, horrible. Horrible. <laughs> horrible. I read lit. Uh, so I'm so out. But good. now we're doing a buyback round. So You're buying back in? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. Okay. But I had fun. Yeah. And it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so how'd your first round go? I did good. I um, beat my component, my partner in the race there. Yeah. All right. Yep. So you made a comeback. After, I did. After I defense. did. And how'd it go with you? I did well. I uh, didn't run nitrous. Uh, bogged a little bit, but I beat the guy by five thousandths of a second. So right on. I whole shot at him. So cool. I'm in for second round. Yeah. Let's, let's see what happens. My goal was to not get eliminated the first round. So to me, I already won this. I won this thing. Right on. Did, did you get By some miracle, I won my first competition round, but then we had to leave early to catch a flight home by 11 p.m. I found out the next day that Alma and Mason both won their respective classes. It was such fun, I went back for a second try. I won't say where I got the Camaro, but it didn't fare as well as the Chevy Spark. I lost my first competition round by breaking out. 
While I love to race on the neighbor islands, it's just not practical. The flying and hotel rooms are too expensive, and getting the race car is a little irregular. Back on Oahu, however, I did find one last legal racing option, sponsored by the Sports Car Club of America, or SCCA. The club started in the 1940s, with the members now organizing both professional and amateur road course racing events of all varieties. The course is set up with traffic cones and racers compete by making timed runs one at a time. That's the solo part. As with drag racing, competitors race in different classes depending upon how modified their cars are. Unlike drag racing, there is no testing. Everyone gets four passes on the course. Rookies, people like me, can race with a driving coach. As part of the race day, all competitors also volunteer time to help with organizing the races. We met the Kubo family, Father Dave, son George, and daughter Michaela, who greatly enjoy the opportunity to race, and Mike Parker, who together with his wife Jennifer, perform a huge amount of service to make these races happen. Actually, I've always been interested in motorsports. Back in uh, the late 80s, um, friends and I, you know, obviously used to go to the quarter mile track when we had one. Uh, we, we tried to do some autocrossing back then, but then, you know, got married, had kids, took some time off, and then in 2009, was able to get back into the sport. In 2010, I bought my Camaro for the sole purpose of getting back in here, and now I'm doing all this. So. I was never big into the car show scene. Uh, you know, we, we attend a few, but you know, I just really wanted to get out there and drive. Want so yeah. they want to participate. So, right. you know, hopefully they bring a quarter mile back. As soon as they do, we'll be all out there. I'm sure everyone that you see here will also be at the quarter mile. Okay. But until then, this is what we got. I love this. This is a really fun. I'm not as competitive as like my, my dad or my um, little brother, little sister are, but I do enjoy coming out, just putting my car on and racing, pushing it really close to the edge of its grip and throttle. It's just really fun and I'm glad that I get to do this with my family. Uh, so how long have you been involved with autocross um, then? This is actually my second time racing. And how do you enjoy it? Um, it's really fun. My whole family does it, so it's nice to come out with them and be able to do something all together. So I am the chief of uh, track and um, timing and scoring, so make sure that we have a track that complies with the safety rules. It's fun, everybody can understand where to go. And also make sure that the timing set up and scoring, so our, our database logs all the time, do the audit, make sure it's all correct. That's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Wow. A lot of pre-work, a lot of post-work. Um, but we love it. Isn't Driving it? the car is just half of it. The other half is hanging out with people and making sure the event runs smooth. I signed up, paid my dues, volunteered service, and wallowed around the little parking lot course in my souped-up sport truck. Not the best choice for SCCA racing, but it was fun. I took some small comfort in not being the slowest around the course. I was close to the slowest, but I think there was a Prius with battery trouble whose time I was able to beat. The SCCA racing on Oahu to me is both a blessing and a frustration. It's a blessing because Oahu does have an outlet where racing enthusiasts can use their cars. It's fun and it captures the friendly and family-oriented aspect of racing that is Hawaii. At the same time, it's frustrating because with a million people on the island, it just seems that the racers of Oahu deserve more than a roughly paved corner of a parking lot once a month. To me, a fair analogy would be if all the golf courses on Oahu were closed because of some environmental hazard caused by pesticide and fertilizer runoff into the ocean. Now the golf community would be in an uproar. Bankers and lawyers would be demonstrating at the Capitol. No worries, the governor has a solution. There's a miniature golf course at the Pearl Ridge Mall that all the golfers on Oahu can spend two hours maintaining for the opportunity to play 18 holes with the putter of their choosing once a month, no practice allowed. The SCCA option is better than nothing, but it's not even close to enough. What's the guy who spent $200,000 building a race car with 1,500 horsepower supposed to do on the parking lot at Aloha Stadium? What about the stock car racers? What about drag racing? What about the motorcycle racers? What about racing at night when it's cool? What about the motorsports spectators? That's a lot of unmet need that could be economic activity making people happy.
After exploring every option available, I still can't find gearheaded satisfaction. I'm back to wrenching on my cars and looking for an empty road to do some testing. Given how speed culture has evolved in the islands over more than a century, it just doesn't seem right that I'm reduced to such silliness in the very place where I grew up learning how to do this stuff. I hope we fairly represented the warmth of the racing communities that exist in Hawaii. The people of this place have created a distinctive speed culture with a playful and gracious spirit that's not seen anywhere else. And local style racing can pay off, as seen in the successful careers of famous Hawaiian racers like Roland Leong, Danny Angaius, and John DeSoto. We explored the cruise scene, where folks like Rocky and Crystal Diaz told us of racing careers and family traditions cut short. At other cruise events, we met young people like Edward Alba, setting up street races and longing for a safe and legal outlet. I'm a professor, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why it's so hard to give such a committed and industrious group a strip of tarmac and a circle of dirt out in the boonies. What we shared of the different neighbor island racetracks was all here on Oahu in 2006. Only many times bigger. Junior drag racers like Ian Kalabe on the Big Island, women racers like Mary Kay Aloha on Kauai, and senior racers like Ken Silva on Maui. There are many like them on Oahu now, more than on any other island. Their racing careers on hold. It's the same with the motorcycle racers, the circle track folks, the military guys, the families involved, the spectators for all these events, the number of speed shops. Oahu had it all on a bigger scale because of our larger population. Even the SCCA racing was much better, more fun, faster. Don't you think David Kubo and his family could make good use of a proper road course? The hardworking, tax-paying racers on Oahu deserve more. 160,000 people took the opportunity to walk through Hawaii Raceway Park one last time when it closed. This community and the culture it has created, its rich history, the commerce it generates, the passion that motivates us, we deserve more. <laughs>